right. Uh, I'm delighted to see all of you back. And um, I, 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 as I was walking out last Wednesday, Norman Stevenson, where are you, Norman? Are you here yet? Norman's around here somewhere, uh, was asked, telling me how much he had uh, been disappointed that I didn't really get to all my woman suffrage slides, and particularly the antis. He was very interested in the anti-suffragists. And so uh, I, told him, I told him that I would briefly begin with that without all of the slides, because believe me, I have talked about this for 25 years, and I could probably talk about it until 5 o'clock tonight. So I am going to give you quite a short little version of this at Norman's request, and you can feel free to make any requests if I get to rushing down towards the end here. Uh, but it is a really interesting story, and I guess I should give you a little shameless self-promotion, which I don't do often, but on May the 2nd, our last class at 5.30 p.m. at Fort Negley, I will be giving an entire talk about woman suffrage. So it's free, it doesn't cost any money. Fort Negley has bounteous parking. They, they park at the Sound Stadium, and this is for the Tennessee Historical Society. Uh, and yes, I know 5.30 and Nashville traffic are a, a challenge, but if you really want to hear the whole story, and as I look out here, I think about 75% of you I know and have heard me tell this story before, but I, I'm, I welcome the opportunity for you to come and uh, hear the story again one more time. Now, I thought today that I would show you these slides just to kind of get the stage set with what's going on with women because we are going to be talking about consumers today. And in that category of consumers are women and men. And so I would like to just point out that the Hermitage Hotel was the seat of all the action down at the Capitol in uh, 1920 when the legislators came to town to decide whether or not Tennessee was going to be the perfect 36 to ratify the 19th Amendment and give women all across the United States the right to vote. Now, the women were packed in there. The legislators had mostly come by train. Uh, keep in mind, in 1920, there were a few cars on the streets of Nashville. As you see, there's one right there. But there weren't very many people with cars, and there were even fewer paved roads. Certainly, out in the rural areas, there were no paved roads. And let me tell you, those rural folks did not want them either. So, here they come, here they come. And, and Carrie Chapman Catt, the national leader, had shown up in Nashville, even though the Tennessee women didn't want her here. I mean, she was from up north. That's Iowa, you understand? <laughs> and um, uh, she uh, would, would be looked at down here as just an outside agitator. So they didn't want her, but she promised the Tennessee women that she would just stay over there at the Hermitage Hotel and never go over to the Capitol. Well, she went out on a variety of little automobile tours uh, the last two weeks of July, essentially just lobbying the legislators to support ratification of this amendment. So a day or two after Miss Cat arrived, who should show up? None other than Josephine, Josephine Pearson, who had been commandeered, volunteered, whatever you want to call it, by the antis led by a lawyer named John J. Vertrice, a prominent Nashville lawyer, uh, to lead the antis. And she was in her full uh, military commanding uh, 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 persona the whole time that she was in the Hermitage Hotel. She was rallying the troops. Now, over at the Tulane Hotel, just a couple of blocks away, there was Alice Paul and her National Women's Party folks. They had split off at the time that we entered World War I with Carrie Chapman Catt's branch of the suffrage movement, simply because they thought that the tactic that the women should use to get the right to vote was strike while the iron is hot, Woodrow Wilson is going to declare war on Germany, so let us uh, make sure that Woodrow Wilson is properly embarrassed to, that he hasn't supported one, women voting since he's uh, uh, going to war against Germany. So they were over there 
And you will see a real demographic divide between the Women's Party women and the NASA, National American Woman Suffrage Association women, in that the NASA people were mostly married. Mom, Carrie Chapman Cat herself was a widow. She didn't have children, but she was a MRS cat. And uh, the, the National Women's Party were primarily career women. The chief, one of the National Women's Party we know here in Tennessee was Sue Shelton White. And they just simply felt that you should use stronger tactics and should be right there pounding away, doing things like chaining themselves to the fence at the White House, telling the president that he was acting like the Kaiser. And so uh, Carrie Chapman Cat was far too uh, uh, embarrassed to do anything of that nature. So they were there at the hotel, and they, they did their contribution. They made their contribution to this. And the fight is going to take place in our capital. Look at all those green trees in that picture. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a miracle to see those sprouting up down there today? And, you know, i got to tell you, I've, I've in recent years given a lot of thought to the anti-suffragists and the Women's Christian Temperance Union, anti-alcohol. And they, these two groups do actually have a lot in common. And when I was talking to Norm last week, he said, well, weren't all the WCTU ladies uh, in favor of suffrage? Oh, no, absolutely not. Just a tiny fraction of them were in favor of suffrage. In fact, preachers had been telling women, don't touch woman suffrage because it's too inflammatory. So the, the religious denominations, the Protestant religious denominations, were backing uh, temperance, but uh, there was just a tiny group of these women who were in favor of women getting the right to vote. They just thought that banning alcohol was going to be enough, that all that was what women needed was the banning of alcohol. And the, uh, the uh, antis, they trotted out these ex-Confederates who are, by 1920, they're not youngsters exactly. And so they're, they're doing everything to say, don't you want to go back to the good old days when we had these beautiful plantations and people working in our fields while we sat on the veranda drinking mint juleps? So here is uh, Josephine Pearson in her full regalia here uh, with a Confederate veteran there uh, beside her. And uh, she, this is, she actually left her papers to the Tennessee State Library and Archives, so this is fairly easy research. Uh, this is what uh, her, the caption she wrote on this said, truth cr crushed to the earth will rise again. So she was expecting the South to rise again and put this notion of women voting uh, away. So we had a great big time here in Nashville. It was quite a little party. One big point I want to make about the suffrage movement, which I hit on last week, is it's a real mistake for us to single out one Nashville woman as the leader and everybody else as her followers and her uh, uh, flock of workers. Because we, we've, in recent years, tended to really single out Ann Dallas Dudley. I think she is important. But if you single her out, you really mistake the whole way that women throughout history have worked. They have come together as a group to solve problems. They weren't climbing the ladder of success. It was a non-competitive group. And what is so remarkable about the suffrage movement unlike the Women's Christian Temperance Union, is that not only were there Protestant women, like Mrs. Dudley, who was an Episcopalian, there were Catholic women, like uh, uh, Catherine Kinney, whose husband, uh, she and her husband had come here from um, Chattanooga because he had gotten the rights to open the first Coca-Cola bottling company in Nashville. Uh, she was able to associate with these Protestant women without any trouble. You have Mrs. Lowenheim. Do any of you remember, I uh, know some of you do, uh, Elizabeth Jacobs? Yeah. 
Well, this was her mother, and she had a great story about she uh, was in one of those suffrage parades with her mother, and they were behind uh, Mrs. Dudley and her children. She, had, she was a beautiful woman and had, uh, I've, I've seen a picture of her with her children, one of which was Elizabeth. And uh, so we have Jewish women, and then amazingly, African Americans joined this movement. And a very kind of hidden away piece of history that a longtime friend of mine who's now deceased, Anita Goodstein, I know that Natalie remembers Anita, she taught at Swanee for many years, she uh, uncovered uh, Frankie J. Pierce, who was an African American woman that Catherine Kenney actually brought to the May 1920 League of Women Voters meeting, the first meeting of the League of Women Voters when the suffrage organization is morphing into the League of Women Voters. Frankie Pierce was brought in and she addressed this sea of white women telling them that African American women wanted to, the right to vote and they would use it well. So I think in uh, all the discussions of voluntary associations, that one fact of our Tennessee suffrage women is quite distinct from other states uh, that were supporting suffrage. And I want to make that point very clear. Uh, there's a really nice article uh, that was published right before Anita Goodstein died in the Journal of of Southern history about Frankie Pierce and her partners, political partnership with um, uh, Catherine Kinney. Now, this is the kind of tactic the antis used, and this is bad, bad, bad. There's Frances Willard, and she supported suffrage, but her organization never fully supported it. So this is the kind of people that women are going to bring in to vote. Uh, convicts. Indians, and just the plain old insane. So this was, this was the scare tactic. It is so easy to sell people scare. And you know, I could go into my college students who are mostly uh, in the zombie state uh, at 8 o'clock in the morning, and I could tell them almost anything. And they would sit there. And if, it, if it's flagrant enough, they won't just sit there. They'll be texting to their buddies. Gosh. And, and here is one good example. About five years ago, somebody came breathlessly into my office to tell me that Barack Obama had abolished the Bill of Rights that day. <laughs> and so, you know, I set him straight. Then I sent him to the dean for the dean, who's a history major, to set him straight. But I guarantee that young man texted that to 50 other people before he left campus. It was just too juicy. No matter what the truth was, he was going to send it on anyway. So we don't have any really good photos of what was going on down there, but the big story of the day was that young Harry T. Byrne changed his vote. He was a, a, a Republican from Nyota, Tennessee, and when he changed his vote, another uh, one of the legislators, Banks Turner, changed his. So after a few shenanigans here and there, the final vote was 50 to 46. And the first time I heard this story was not uh, when I came here and, and literally uh, walked into Dewey Grantham's history seminar at Vanderbilt in September 1971. It was not then. It was not until the 1980s that I ever heard this story existed because it's just been sort of hidden away. But for about the past 25, 30 years, there's more and more said about this story, and it really is quite remarkable because his mother wrote him a letter, and he said, I always take my mother's advice. So it was, it was quite a remarkable thing for him to do it, and luckily he got reelected in November. Our governor, the Democrat Albert Roberts, did not win re-election, and of course he blamed it on the women. If he hadn't supported woman suffrage and calling that special session, he would have been re-elected. I don't necessarily think that was it, but that's what he thought. And so here is Harry who makes this decision. And, you know, this story has been locked up or forgot. It was for a long time because we're focused on mostly 
political and military history. And even though this fits the bill of political history, it's just one that has never come out until the civil rights movement uh, and the real uh, uh, budding of woman's history. There was no woman's history to speak of in 1971. I wrote my master's thesis on a Supreme Court justices' appointment. So uh, there was no real woman's history until the civil rights movement set the pace. And on that note, I must say, I'm sure everyone in this room remembers where you were 50 years ago today. It's one of those move mo moments that none of us can forget. And so I think it's appropriate uh, that we here acknowledge the work that Dr. King did that rippled out to many other groups of people who were minorities and oppressed as well. So with that, here we go with consumerism. Now, I want to make another point that I made last week. It was such a heartbreak for these women who were in the suffrage movement. They just thought the world was going to change, the sun would be shining every day. They were so excited about this, and it turned out most of the women didn't bother to go out and register to vote. You had to pay your poll tax. And if the women that went out and voted, they just voted like their husband did. They, there was not an independent woman's vote. But remember that election of 1920 with Warren G. Harding as the presidential standard bearer and the winner, uh, it was just a real reaction to eight years of Woodrow Wilson, who was just so involved in changing the world and changing American society. But I do love this picture, and I, this is in the League of Women Voters National Files, but I do love this picture because out there in the middle of nowhere in Petty, Texas, was my 40-year-old grandmother and her only child, my four-year-old mother. And let me tell you, she went to the Methodist Church in Petty that election day and voted, and because of something that happened, what, five miles from here maybe, if the, as the crow flies, something that happened here in Tennessee. And let me tell you, my grandmother, who had spent 40 years not voting, uh, she never missed an election. And it sort of trickled down to her daughter, my mother, the last time I took my mother to vote, she was living over at the retired teachers in Green Hills. And, you know, this is the typical thing. Any of you who know me know I've always got 15 things to do in time for 10. So uh, I was running to go pick up Mama to take her to vote. And we were going to the Green Hills Library to vote. And I, I walked into the retired teachers, and they're sitting patiently waiting for her wayward daughter was my mother with her navy blue skirt, her red blazer, and her American flag pin. <laughs> and that's how I like to remember my mother. So there's poor Governor Roberts. He lost his election. Um, he, he loses to Alfred Taylor, a Republican. Taylor only served one year, and, and then the Democrats got their act back together and elected Austin P., who is regarded as our progressive governor in Tennessee, but only because he was a Democrat working with a Democratic General Assembly. Our true progressive governor was Ben Hooper, who had been elected because Luke Lee had abandoned the Democratic candidate in favor of Hooper in 1914, and Hooper was elected, he had this whole ambitious program of, of societal change, but the Democrats said, we will not support anything, whether it's good or bad, it's irrelevant, we're not going to support it. So Hooper did not have a successful two, four years as governor. Austin P. comes in, and he has the support of the Democrats, and he's able to make some maneuvers. We're going to be talking a lot about him throughout the rest of this course uh, to, to get things that really were somewhat helpful to Tennessee. But today, I want to talk about shopping, and I brought some of my treasures from home. Now, this is a book I got as a freshman at Baylor University. It's got my 
Uh, much better than it is now, handwriting for my name, Carol Stanford in this with freshman reading for the Survey of American History course only yesterday by Frederick Lewis Allen. And don't be looking at me so blankly because I know some of you all have this in your boxes and your attics. Now, okay, the Coens got rid of the world book, so I doubt that they have one. So Ter Terry wanted me to know last week that they had had to part with their world books. And uh, so, but this book, it is still a gem. And some of you know that I listen to a lot of audio books free from your Metro Public Library. I download them on an MP3 player and plug it into my sound system in my car. This book, it's a great book to listen to. So if you get out and walk or do anything that is fairly mindly, some, uh, I think one day I was actually wearing this at Vol State and Rick Rao said to me, so do you listen to that while you're teaching? <laughs> so I assured him that I did not. I can barely do one thing at once, let alone two things at once. But I do listen to a lot of recorded books. If you want a good one, it'll take you back. The only problem with this book is Frederick Jackson Allen is, Frederick Lewis, Frederick Lewis Allen is a great writer, but he wrote this in 1931 or 32. So, you know, he didn't have the perspective that people like, I hope there are no history professors here hearing me say this. This will make them cringe. He did not. He was a, a journalist, too. He editor of the New Republic, I think. Uh, he didn't have the perspective that Bill Bryson had in the summer 1927. So I read that book, and I enjoyed it. Uh, his pure, purest historians think that's a little pedestrian, but I enjoyed it myself. So we are going to talk about shopping. And one of the things that Frederick Lewis Allen does so effectively in this book is that he opens with Mr. and Mrs. Smith getting ready to sit down to breakfast, and it's 1919. And he wants to convey to his readers from the beginning that in 1919, Mr. and Mrs. Smith haven't changed much of the way they do things from 1876. Uh, and what he's, the big point he wants to make is things are getting ready to really, really change here with uh, the coming of this new decade, the age of normalcy as President Warren G. Harding wanted it to be known as. So, you know, you've got, you've got Mr. and Mrs. Smith sitting down to breakfast. Now, men's clothing Let's just face it, ladies, it hadn't changed hardly a bit. Uh, you might change the width of the lapels, the length of the cuffs on the pants, but they don't change. It's sort of a glacial movement in men's fashion. Uh, and, but women's clothes really changed. Now, here is Mrs. Smith wearing one of these hobble-skirted suits. Uh, it's very demure. It's maybe six inches above the ground. She, it's springtime. She's given up her boots that she has to wear, and she's got some low heel shoes on on this particular day that they are eating breakfast. She uh, is going shopping that day. She has on a lovely business suit. She will put on a hat that will have a veil on it. She won't necessarily be covered with a veil, Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> that was not Mrs. Smith, though. That's what, but what we're afraid she's going to turn into. So, uh, nonetheless, nonetheless, Mrs. Smith is going to be wearing uh, something uh, somewhat like this for a day of shopping. She will go out and she will shop. Uh, she will not be going to a beauty salon. Uh, women do not go to beauty salons, even though one of the most interesting entrepreneurs in American history was already deceased by 1920, but it was Madam C.J. Walker. Madam C.J. Walker has a great story. Uh, you know, she uh, was an African-American woman who was largely impoverished, and so she started figuring out unique ways for African-American women to treat their hair and that would be more conducive uh, to what their hair was naturally like. And so she made a fortune long before uh, the white women got into the cosmetic business. 
But uh, you went to a hair parlor where you got your long hair quaffed, but you did not get your hair cut. If you had your hair cut, you just cut it yourself. And if you really felt the need as a woman to get your hair just trimmed up a little bit, you'd just go to the barber shop. But you wouldn't go when the men were expected to be there. So this whole cosmetic industry is going to burst forth very quickly. If she put anything on her face, it was perhaps just a little bit of powder, but any other kind of makeup would have been absolutely out of the question for her. So in the 20s, we're going to get beauty parlors. And wouldn't you love to sit there and get your hair curled under that? I think that that would be, I mean, you, I would be afraid I'd get sucked up into that thing. So um, anyway, it looks more like those pneumatic tubes that we used to have in department stores uh, than, than a place where you go get your hair done. But anyway, that's coming. And um, we're going to have a lot of new fashions coming because the Sears Roebuck catalog is now fully in the 20s, coming into its own. And this is what I love when my children are, are at home and they're, you know, they act like L.L. L. Bean's catalog was the first mail order catalog. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Now, don't tell Ray Busey that I have this. He thinks I'm a pack rat. Uh, when this came to our mailbox in Texas, this book gave me more pleasure than any book because we went to school, we went to church, we played with, my brother and I played with each other, we played the piano, we read books from the library, but this was the wish book. And this was just the Christmas edition, which of course as a child was my personal favorite, but the big one, which we got in the fall and the spring, was huge. And the coming of this was such a treat for us. So uh, uh, if you all have any of these, uh, you can probably sell it on eBay, but <laughs> I'm not going to part with mine, right? Not now. Maybe later. Maybe, maybe later. So look at how dresses are going to change. We're shortening them. They're, those hems are going to continue going up. And you know, we appear, the description that Alan gives of Mrs. Smith is that she's a fairly buxom woman and she has a lot of underclothing on underneath her suit but she is doing nothing to minimize her bosom to make it look small and boyish and that's coming here very very quickly when the younger set are going to quit wearing stockings they are going to try to look as boyish and skinny as they can and the it girl is Clara Bow. We'll be talking about her next week when we talk about celebrities. So you want to look like Sarah, uh, Clara Bow? You can buy yourself a hat from Sears and Roebuck for 95 cents. Keep in mind, they were in the mail order business, so to speak. You, as I remember, you ordered it from the catalog, but then you went to the store in town and picked it up. But uh, they, they were in the mail order business before credit cards. So how, how that worked, that's amazing. And you could buy anything from Sears. You could buy yourself a house. These are 1920s houses. Now these houses, I picked these out especially because uh, driving around rural Fannin County as a child, we would always come to Sam Rayburn's house, which was a bigger house than this, and his brother, who had, and it was always prefaced by, oh, that's that house he ordered from Sears and Roebuck. But my aunt had uh, this model here, and again, it comes in partially assembled parts, and you put it together. So, uh, you know, Amazon will bring almost anything now, so who knows what they might be bringing. And look at this. We think that guns are a problem today. Let me tell you, you could buy your own weaponry from the Sears catalog. $10.45 for that. You could buy yourself a, a, a pump organ. Uh, you could have almost anything. And now we're going to find something else to really, really capture our imagination. 
and make us want to save money and spend money and even borrow money like nobody's business. Here we have in 1906 Lee DeForest patenting a device by which you can transmit sound through the air. And this is going to be the forerunner of the radio. So, you know, one thing that Americans, I think, are very good at is they take one idea and then we start working on it and we keep working on it and working on it and soon we figured out a way to mass produce things and make things cheaper and more accessible to more people. So he has this idea for this and he gets his Audion patented and the rest is history. He even got himself a postage stamp. Uh, so one of the first uses of this was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, because Pittsburgh was the headquarters of Westinghouse, and they had all sorts of engineering things going on there. And uh, uh, so the, you don't think of this as Episcopalian. All you Episcopalians can disagree with me and tell me after class. Uh, but, but really one of the very first broadcasts on his radio uh, device was at the Calvary Episcopal Church over there in Shadyside. If you've ever been to Pittsburgh, uh, it was over there in Shadyside, and they uh, started having their worship service on, on, not online, on the radio. The only problem was, you know, there weren't that many people that had these devices. So we got to figure out how we can get more devices to these people. This was the first religious service that was aired in the United States. And uh, uh, lots of other people got, got the uh, notion after this. But Pittsburgh Westinghouse had uh, created a radio station. W, uh, no, it was KDKA radio station. And they are going to, among other things, broadcast uh, this church service for a while. And uh, it's new. It's an entertainment device. Uh, but it seems to have potential. You can look at the radio as pitching a great big tent all over the country. And so the problems they had, I'm sure you've heard some of these, were the problems they had with static and getting clean, clean sound to come out of these devices. So they start trying to look at interesting things that can be broadcast. And of course, sports are right out there as a uh, uh, something that people want to hear. There was a great deal of interest in boxing in the 1920s, and people started thinking, hmm, I sure wish I could hear that uh, wrestling match uh, with uh, Dempsey, Jack Dempsey and George Carpentier fighting in 1921. The fight of the century it was billed as, well, there are going to be lots more fights of the century before the century is all over, but people loved it. The people that could hear it uh, absolutely loved it. Uh, they had sort of what you and I would call a telephone transmitter to listen to this, and they uh, had to more or less hold this thing. It was a, a slaughter, and the announcer who is announcing it describes how bloody it is, how, uh, what is going on in the ring, and people said they think it's like being there. Even with all the static, it was like being there. And so the New York Times uh, uh, over here on about page six gets around to telling us that the, the thing was spread through the wires and the tele telegraph lines were used and uh, that this could be the wave of the future. So it was quite a big event there and there were souvenir programs and all sorts of stuff. The first radio station in Tennessee was purchased, opened by a church, and it was the first Baptist church in Knoxville. In 1921, they decided they would 
create a radio station for the purpose of reaching out to the world and broadcasting their services and other things. They only kept that radio station for about two years. Uh, they sold it to a commercial enterprise. I think, I don't know what the problem was or why they decided to sell it, but knowing any variety of denominations, I imagine that there was a debate as to some wanted it and some didn't, and so they finally got rid of it. Now, down at Lewisburg, uh, you all ever been to David Crockett State Park down there? It's down uh, sort of uh, west of I-65. If you're going down towards uh, Alabama, it's west of the interstate. Lewisburg had none other than James D. Vaughn living there. Now, James... Uh, excuse me, Lawrenceburg. I'm thinking of Lewisburg, which is on the east side of the interstate. Lawrenceburg is on the west side of the interstate, and I actually do know that. It, it takes a village here. So, <laughs> so raise, your, raise your hands. I need anything I'm doing wrong, uh, raise your hands. Uh, so, Mr. Vaughn in Lawrenceburg uh, had... A, a, he and his brothers had sung in a gospel quartet. Uh, and they went around Tennessee, rural Tennessee, and, and did singing. And so one thing led to another, and he started operating, James Vaughn started operating singing schools. And essentially people from various, uh, mostly rural, mostly uh, you know, fundamentalist type churches would go to these singing schools on the weekend and just sing all weekend. I mean, it, it must have been great entertainment for them. So it was so successful going out and doing these singing schools that he started a publishing business, publishing uh, song books for singing schools. I actually have some of these at home too that were my grandmother. She loved going to these things. So things, things were going so well that he started his own record company and then he opens a radio station because this is the way to really spread gospel music. So W-O-A-N radio station opened in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee and it was quite popular and everybody loved it. People enjoyed hearing him, and, and with each passing year, somebody has improved the, uh, uh, the quality of the sound that's coming out. So, things are going quite well with the radio. The radio announcers in uh, uh, Pittsburgh are the ones that are getting all the attention, and they're going to continue getting that. But now we're hearing songs on our radio, if you have one, it, from, from the Ziegfeld Follies in New York City. You'll hear My Rambler Rose being sung. You'll hear all of these things being sung. Now, here are some uh, statistics that I think are worth actually giving you about the radio. In 1919, in the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature, you all remember that dinosaur? Um, uh, it was a, a big, big books at your college library shelf or your public library shelf. Uh, in 1919 to 1921, there were two columns in the Reader's Guide <coughs> devoted to radicals and radicalism. Remember I talked about the Palmer Raids last week? and less of a quarter of a column was devoted to any references at all on the radio. 1922 to 24, the Reader's Guide, Radicals and Radicalism, got half a column. Radio, 19 columns. It had taken off the idea that you could be entertained at home by people that are uh, five or six hundred miles away, people could not believe it and it is getting magazines and uh, getting recognized in magazines all over the country. Now, we're shoppers. This is how you go to the store. Uh, this is a store in Memphis. Uh, there are clerks there. They have mostly food. They will uh, have those clerks. You are met by the clerk and you'll tell the clerk what you want and the clerk will go get it for you. Any of you all ever been to the Pink Palace? The Pink Palace was the home built by Clarence Saunders. 
Clarence Saunders had one of these stores in Memphis, and he was looking for a better way to sell groceries, to, to make, you know, let's maximize our profit. So what he decided to do was to take these people more or less out of the operation, and what he decided to do was let the people go get their, their purchases for themselves. He patented a plan for a unique design of a grocery store. You would get rid of the counter. Uh, the customers would go in. They would pick whatever they want. They go in for five pounds of sugar and a pound of coffee, and they come out with the post toasties cornflakes becoming all the rage and Aunt Jemima syrup and about five other things. So you've got to have, everything is about marketing, right? And you've got to brand. This is the language that I'm constantly amused about, people talking about branding. I, I, I find this very interesting phenomena of our recent society. So he decided he would come up with a clever name, and he branded his new idea grocery store as Piggly Wiggly. And so the first Piggly Wiggly was born in Memphis, and it was an overnight su success. There were clerks in there to ring up your charges, your purchases, but the clerks were told by Mr. Saunders, under no circumstance are you to go get something for a customer. You are to let the customers get their own products. You can say aisle three. Well, I'm always delighted at Publix when the person says, well, let me go help you find that. I mean, I'm, I'm all about the people at Publix offering to help me uh, find, because I will be looking right at it and can't find uh, the tomato sauce. So. We, he's, he's making money, and he starts franchising this in the 1920s. And the problem is he got greedy. He got in trouble with Wall Street, and um, he lost his entire empire. He uh, had tax problems, a lot of other problems, and Clarence Saunders lost his entire empire. But the man... I, I guess he, he died in maybe about 1950-something, but he was, he was still constantly, his mind was just very uh, uh, vigorous, and he was thinking of, he had tried a, a self-service shoe store, a self-service, we have those now, don't we? Uh, he, he tried vending machines before vending machines. He's quite an interesting fella, and uh, there's a lot of material out there. There's an article about him in the Smithsonian. I can send you an article that appeared in the Tennessee Historical Quarterly about him. He's a very interesting guy. Now, all of you know some part of this story, I'm relatively sure. If you knew Margaret Ann Robinson, you knew that this was her family story, and uh, her... I guess it was her grandfather uh, bought, C.A. Craig, Edwin Craig, bought this insurance company on the steps of the Nashville uh, City Courthouse at a bankruptcy sale. And he bought this company and tried to turn a bankrupt company into a profit-making company. And so what he did was that he uh, got some partners to invest in it, and they took full advantage of the fact that Nashville had already become a center for drummers, drummers being traveling salesmen. Because of our transportation system going out of the city, the trains going in so many different directions, we were, we were a very... Uh, by 1925, really a center of wholesale businesses. And so there were wholesale salesmen for pharmaceuticals, for Martha White Flour, for Maxwell House Coffee, and lots of other things coming out of Nashville to be sold. And so what Mr. Craig and the partners that he uh, recruited to be in this venture with him decided to do was that they decided uh, that they were going to try to reach out further, reach out to rural people. Most people who had insurance mostly lived in cities, and it was mostly insurance uh, for, for uh, 
uh, uh, industrial accidents. It was mostly industrial accident insurance, some life insurance. But rural people, they, they were a, kind of a different market out there. And so they were going to use this big system that had already been established of uh, transportation and traveling to sell insurance. So they got their, their thing, their insurance company going. And they decided, wouldn't a radio station be a nice addition? Let's sell some insurance on the radio. So in 1925, in October 1925, WSM Radio went on the air from the offices of the National Life Center, which uh, they'll get a new building in the 30s, but they they're have a pretty, pretty small operation at this point. They've been in business for, I guess, about 20-something years. And they, uh, they, they hire a writer who had been uh, formerly with the Commercial Appeal, and then he went and became an announcer for a Chicago radio station. They hired George Hay to be the program director. And mostly what George Hay uh, uh, played on the radio were classical music, dinner music. Uh, there was some news, but not a lot, but it was mostly music. And so one Saturday night, a month after the station had opened, George Hay got the idea of having something different. And he invited Uncle Jimmy Thompson from LaGuardia, Tennessee. If you all know Wilson County, you may know where Lebanon is, but LaGuardia, it's right there. So um, it's a tiny little place. Uh, but uh, LaGuardia, he was, uh, he was 77 years old, and he was a fiddler. He made no pretensions of being anything else other than a fiddler. So Saturday was the day that people came to town, and, and, and he was in town. And so George Hay put him on the radio station Saturday night. Well, let me tell you, folks absolutely loved his music. And so suddenly, these people who are coming to set town for the day to shop also want to stay and see if they can hear this music live in uh, the city. And so this starts out as the WSM Barn Dance. Uh, he had had a similar program in Chicago, so that was why he was seeing if it would work down here in Tennessee. And no one could have ever predicted how fast this would take off. They quickly had to move out of the National Life offices. They had to move. They moved to a, a, over on Fatherland to a, a religious uh, structure called the Dixie Tabernacle. Uh, and then ultimately in the 1940s, they moved to the Ryman Auditorium. Now, their brand, let's see if y'all can get this. Their motto was, we shield millions. So do y'all figure out why they are WSM? So they start off, and it'll be quickly changed. One night, uh, George Hay is on there, and he's been broadcasting uh, opera all day long, and it's time for the country barn dance. And so he tells his listeners there uh, that we're going to hear a different kind of Opry tonight, and it'll be grand, it'll be the grand old Opry. So he was taking uh, uh, this to a whole new level, and as you know, the rest is history. So here is this program that takes off. Uh, Uncle George, there's George Hayes, there's Uncle Jimmy Thompson. Uh, he brings in instrumentalists. He will eventually bring in our favorite uh, uh, Nashvilleian, uh, Minnie Pearl, who was quite, quite an entertaining character. Uh, they will move to this nicer building, and uh, the Opry is still going strong, uh, and many of the fat things that people have always loved about it are still going on out there. Uh, a little while later, they, they, in the 30s, they uh, decided to take a kind of a risk, so to speak, and WSM installed one of these diamond antennas uh, uh, to uh, 
broadcast further and more clearly. So the first one was, was actually over there sort of towards 12 South on the top of one of those hills. You've seen that hill. There's, I think, Channel 8 has a big antenna over there. But then they moved it out to Williamson County. Um, and the exit, you can see it when you go to, to Cool Springs. I can't remember the name of the exit, but you see it over there. Yeah, Concord Road. So it's, it's quite big. Now imagine people are listening to this and they don't even have electricity. They've got a crank generator. They don't even have electrical lines, but they have to have a radio. You crank it up and hope it'll run till your program is off. And uh, so imagine, fast forward to the coming of the Rural Electrification a Administration and putting lines, electric lines to these people's houses, how changing that's going to be. So it's the 1920s. And here are two sociologists, Robert and Helen Lind. And they had lived mostly in the Illinois, Indiana, Ohio area. And they become very interested in uh, how Americans are living what they're spending their money on, what they are doing. And so they start doing interviews throughout the 1920s. Uh, they are doing a variety of kinds of interviews with just citizens, uh, primarily in Muncie, uh, Indiana. And uh, they ask a lot of questions about what do you do with your money? Uh, do you go to church? Uh, do you uh, have any outside activities, how much education do you have, what kind of education are you providing for your children. And so they've collected all this data. And in 1929, just before this decade is about to end, they finally publish all of their findings in a very interesting book called uh, Middletown. And Middletown really describes average American life. And in this book, they talk about uh, all the things that have changed since uh, uh, World War I. They talk about things that have caused the change. And when they interview one person, he, this person, one resident, said this. We're probably living in one of the greatest eras of greatest rapidity of change in the history of human institutions. Why on earth do you need to study what's changing in this country, this person said. It's changing. I can tell you what is happening in this country, what's happening to this country. Four letters. A-U-T-O. If we thought the, rail, the, the radio was changing things, the auto was really changing things. Never before had we had to have one of these. The trains had these, but a policeman in Detroit said, we've got chaos, we've got to have some order to the traffic. And this was in uh, very, very early. He came up with this design very, very early, and it, it had a green light and a red light, and then when it was getting ready to go from green to red, you would hear a beep. So once again, take one idea and build on it. So William Potts comes along and he adds the yellow light and suddenly you see these in every city. Uh, New York City suddenly gets traffic lights. 1923, New York has some traffic lights for the third time. People were complaining about the traffic in New York City. Traffic jams. The average speed on Fifth Avenue was three miles an hour. <laughs> You can't go fast enough. The national, national fatalities are going up. In 1919, 5,400 people had been killed in car accidents. Uh, in 1924, 9,800 people had been killed in car accidents. So we are going car crazy in the 1920s. In Kansas City, Kansas City, Tyke says, let's give you a place to go in that car. And Kansas City opens the first shopping center. And so it will have people now not coming into downtown, 
which had been so vibrant, at least when the first cars came out, by the end of the 20s, people are already abandoning shopping downtown and going out to these shopping centers that have abundant, free, visible parking. So, you know, no one really thought the car would bring about the demise of the downtown business district, but it certainly did make a contributing fa factor. And in 1929, magazines were saying, well, you know, everybody's got a car now. I think the market is saturated. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Cars offered freedom of movement, and people wanted to move. People wanted to go faster and further all the time. You, farmers were helped by this the best, although they were the most opposed to building better, spending money for better roads. But you've got now a farm family which has been so isolated here in Tennessee, like other farm states, now they've got rural free delivery, mail coming to the house. They might be able to get a telephone, possibly. They may be able to get mail order shopping. And the car gives that family true mobility. We can go, we can get out, we can see the greater greater world. So a farm woman was asked, you know, why do you all have a car? You don't even have a bathtub. And her answer to this was, you can't go to town in a bathtub. <laughs> that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, so uh, Nathan Miller, who has a very interesting book about the 20s, he's a journalist, uh, he, he described the car as the breaking force in breaking down the barriers between the city and the country, and the country people come to town, and uh, the middle class people began moving out to the suburbs as, people, as downtown is becoming more congested. So for now, you know, in the 20s, we have to build our houses all around having a car. So we're going to have deeper lawns now. We're going to try to provide a driveway uh, on our property so that we don't have to park on an already crowded street. And the vocabulary that's associated with automobiles just bursts out. So now you suddenly have joyride, flat tire, spark plug being taken for a ride out there. And you know, who is going to want to take advantage of this the most? Our young people. I mean, I can go pick up Mary Sue, and I can take her in my car out. I don't have to sit on her parents' front porch. I can take her out. And parents, they love it but they get nervous. And this is a point I want to keep making for the rest of these sessions. People love what the change is. We don't want to get rid of the radio, but we're also scared of the fact that it's giving our children knowledge that we just as soon they not have. What if one of my children decides that he wants to become a player for the Pittsburgh Pirates? We're listening to his baseball games. We're listening to the Pirates baseball games in Salina, Tennessee. What if he wanted to leave Salina and go play with the Pirates? I mean, so parents start getting nervous about all of these things, but they still want to see it happen. Now, Henry Ford has has a remarkable story, and uh, I, I will share a little bit of it with you simply because I think he really today is one of the more controversial people in American history. Uh, he was a, a very interesting guy. He was crude. He really, some people say he was functionally illiterate. Uh, he didn't have much use for education, and he was very prejudiced towards lots of different people. Uh, when, oddly enough, a highway was going to take the home where he had been born, he bought the home uh, that uh, he had grown up in out on a farm and, and brought it in and created a whole village. And I wouldn't call this utopian. I would call this more... Um, at nostalgic than anything. If you go up to Michigan and tour this, you will see that this creation 
was really an idyllic world of the past. He wanted to go back. The name of this place is Greenfield Village. It's a big tourist attraction now. They've got all sorts of things. Henry Ford built it. He made his fortune with cars. And guess what? You ride around in a horse-drawn carriage. So I think, that, I think that tells you quite a lot about Henry Ford. Henry Ford had grown up in a large family. His mother died when he was 13 years old, giving birth to her eighth children. Now, the way that Henry tells the story of what happened the rest of his life and how his siblings and even his father told the story of what happened were quite different. Uh, Henry Ford said that he didn't get along with his father after that, that uh, he, his father didn't like him tinkering with machinery. He was one of these young men. His sisters said that one year they had each received a top, a mechanical top that you pull the string and it spins for Christmas, and Henry wanted to take the things apart and see how the things worked. And so Henry's version of this, which he told to his authorized biographers, was that uh, my father did not like uh, me tinkering with machinery. He wanted me to farm and do nothing else except farm. And so I ran away from home at the age of 16 and left for Dearborn, Michigan, uh, a nearby town. And so he tells the story of, of him being uh, uh, treated badly by his father. He had uh, one, one room education, uh, the same as pretty much everybody else out in the rural American uh, uh, farmland of this country. He uh, uh, had uh, eight, eight years of school, and that was enough for anybody he felt. So he gets apprenticed to a machine shop in Dearborn. And he works for that, and he's tinkering, constantly tinkering with putting wheels on some kind of a carriage and making it move with an internal combustion engine. Now, this idea had been around for a good long while, and it had already been done, but he comes up with his own version of this, and he's the one who once again takes somebody else's ideas and uh, makes, finds a way to make uh, a considerable amount of money uh, by mass producing these things. So he is working to perfect putting a, an engine on essentially a box and putting some wheels on the box, and the engine will turn at least the back wheels. Now, this had been done in Germany uh, in the late 1880s. Uh, it had been demonstrated in the United States in Springfield, Massachusetts in 1893. Uh, but Henry Ford, in 1896, tests his first quadricycle on the streets of Detroit one early morning before anybody else got out. Now, as you can see, this is a pretty primitive looking vehicle here. Uh, it's basically uh, the driver sitting on a box that covers up the engine. You've got four wheels on it that he took off of a bicycle. You steer it there. Uh, uh, without a steering wheel, you steer it with a tiller rather than a wheel. It has no brakes, no reverse gears. There's a bicycle chain moving the wheels on the back of this. And he had a doorbell. He took a doorbell and put it on here to be his horn. So Americans, Americans are really, really interested in this but it doesn't seem to be practical. There are 500 different American companies organized between 1900 and 1910 just to manufacture and sell some kind of motorized vehicle, and almost all of them fail. So Henry Ford tries to sell his ideas, and one idea fails, Nobody wants to buy it. The next idea fails. He puts steam on one. He keeps trying. He decides that, well, maybe I'll get publicity for my ideas by becoming an automobile racer, which was very popular at this time. 
So he will do some racing for a while, and he does get some attention from doing that. So he decides that the thing to do is build a race car. And he builds what becomes known as the Ford, nine, uh, the Ford 999 uh, car that is going to be raced. He hires a daredevil bicycle uh, racer, Barney uh, Oldfield, to, ride, to drive his car in a race. He has to teach Barney how to drive it uh, first, but Barney wins the race, and suddenly he does get attention for his vehicles there. You know a good bit of this story. After tinkering and tinkering and tinkering, he will finally come up with the ID, idea for the Model T. And the T standed for the number 20 because that was how many designs he had made before, prior to this. This was his 20th design of this vehicle with a motor on it. And he is quite excited about this. He continues to tinker with this, but he, he's, he's now funded the Ford Motor Company with capital that he has been able to raise. Uh, he contributes no cash to this operation. It is funded at $100,000. He himself will be the uh, manager of this plant. He will be the brains, the mechanical brain, so to speak. He will receive a salary uh, for this and a 25% stock option. So he will be given 25% of the stock in exchange for running the company. Now, he's working on this. He's trying to manufacture it and, and, and make, it, make it sell, make it profitable to sell. His ideas were taken on by lots of different people. Roman Oldsmo Ran Ransom Oldsmobile, uh, uh, Ransom Olds tried this with his Oldsmobile. He was trying to make a cheap car. He came up with a catchy song, Riding in My Merry Oldsmobile, but he was turning out cars, but not fast enough to get them into the hands of enough people. Henry Ford finally perfects the Model T. And the Model T had just about anything you could want. It was really, really, really reliable. It was rugged. It had power. And the price was under all the prices of all the competition out there. It was a favorite with farmers because you could put a bed on the back and haul your milk to market. You could haul your crops to market. It was as utilitarian as a plow. The bootleggers in the 20s will find this very effective, a good way to carry your goods from Canada down to the United States. So he had started before World War I experimenting with some kind of mass production because it took, five, it took 12 hours to build one car, and he and his men built these cars in groups of five, and then they, I think, got up to ten. But they were making them in groups, but they were still taking so much time to do it. In 1914, he uh, shocks the entire world uh, by offering to raise the salaries of all his workers to five dollars an hour. And this was quite shocking uh, to people. He finally comes up with the notion of the assembly line. And with the assembly line, in one year, he can produce 300,000 cars. His workers are worth this wage. And, they, excuse me, they are not paid $5 an hour. They're paid $5 a day. The standard, that, that was way too much money. $5 a day, but still, the, the, the going rate for labor in any factory was $2.34 a day. So $5 is doubling your money. And the reason he felt like he needed to do this was a business decision, because it was so boring to work on that assembly line and do the same monotonous job over and over and over that the workers were quitting like crazy. So he said, okay, I'm going to give you a raise. You're going to want to stay when you're making more money, even if you are bored to tears here. So he starts turning out cars and keeping his workforce. He, uh, I read one story about him that just to keep 100 people working, he had to hire 984 people 
the, uh, the number of people who quit before he raised the salaries was so high. And so this was a great deal for the workers, and they didn't want to quit now that they're working for him. He is doing well, and he, in the 1920s, is looked at as some kind of a folk hero in this country, even though he has so many prejudices. He is anti-African American. He is anti-Jew. He is anti any kind of higher education. He wouldn't let his son Edsel go to college. He thought that was a waste of time. Uh, but he is considered uh, the genius of this new age of the automobile. Other people get in the business too. Walter Chrysler will take over uh, Maxwell Motor Company. Uh, he will then buy out the Dodge Brothers, so he gets his own little empire going there. Ford's strategy is to make a car that will last for years and years and years. Well, what do you do when your market's completely saturated? Okay, everybody's got a car. Well, we've got to figure out a way to get people to buy two cars. And so that's the first thing. You need to buy two cars. And then maybe they don't need to last quite so long as forever. <laughs> so in 1926, Ford suddenly dropped to number two behind Chrysler, and General Motors was really up there too. And this made him very nervous. People were telling him, you need to produce some more models besides the Model T. And he was very stubborn and didn't want to do this. But when he gets down to number three, he decides he has to do this. So in this is what is entailed. He has this big plant that is doing so well. He has to close it down for nine months and completely retool every piece of machinery and retool everything in that factory, all the assembly lines, and buy new equipment just to go from the Model T to the Model A. And it was quite a production. But when he finally got the thing, the Model A out there, the suspense of its unveiling uh, was was unbelievable. People all over the country were waiting to see what this was going to be. December 2nd, 1927. A hundred thousand people are milling around the Ford dealership in Detroit where the Model A is going to be unveiled. It is unveiled there. The police had to come in in Cleveland and New York City because the crowds were so big uh, to see the unveiling of the Model A. And nothing changed this country like the car did. There's his racing car. There's his Model T. He tried different things. He, he, you know, what was the joke? You can have a Model T in any color you want as long as it's black. <laughs> well, coming along with the cars are advertisement to sell to the drivers of the car. The uh, advertising comes right along behind all of this, uh, and uh, Ford uh, realizes that people, the car is, is, is going to change the country. One last thing about Tennessee. Uh, our President Woodrow Wilson, one of the things that he passed before we entered World War I was the Federal Highway Act of 1916 by which the federal government would take the responsibility to build roads connecting every city in the country, federal highways. And it was going to be paid for on a cost-sharing basis. The states would put up half the money, and the federal government would provide the other half. Guess what? Tennessee's legislature turned him down. Uh, the farmers were saying, we don't want those roads. Uh, might bring outsiders in. We won't use them. We're happy with the old muddy roads. So he, he had uh, quite a, 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 a challenge here, Woodrow Wilson, to get states to in, uh, go in for this. But it wasn't until 1923 that Austin P. finally convinced the legislature to, to create a highway system for the state and take advantage of this pool of money coming from the federal government. Now, the legislature did not want to raise taxes. So how are we going to pay for those roads? 
We are going to put a tax on gasoline that is designated solely for roads. It will go exclusively to road building and repair. Yes, I know y'all have ridden on us. 440 lately. Um, maybe some could be spent there. And uh, when that happened, we finally started building highways in Tennessee. Thank you very much.